This is the only time that the swastika ever flew over Cardiff. The date is October the 1st, 1938, when Neville Chamberlain had come back from the Munich Conference claiming that he had peace with honour. The Lord Mayor of Cardiff decided to fly the four flags of the nations of Munich, Britain, France, Italy and Germany, uh, over the City Hall. There was a lot of argument about flying the swastika and some people tried to, uh, to pull it down. There was to be no war in 1938, but there had been a fear of war. And a week or two earlier, hasty trenches had been dug, like this one in Cate's Park, where people could take share, shelter in case of an air raid. As the winter of 1938 stretched into 1939, so it became clear that war was coming, despite Neville Chamberlain's efforts at Munich. And the council began preparing air raid shelters for the population in the event of air raids. The old Roman wall at Cardiff Castle was to be used for this purpose, and served as an air raid shelter during the Second World War. In this picture you can see the ramp leading into the castle wall just behind that second uh, tram. Here people could take shelter during the Blitz on Cardiff in, in safety, a purpose for which the Romans had never dreamt of 2,000 years earlier. There are still traces of the Second World War when you look around Cardiff, and this is an example. The window that you can see to the right of the main entrance to the castle is where the entrance used to be. After the war, the ramp was removed and a glass window was put there to cover up the entrance. Individual shelters were also prepared for people. One of the most popular was the Anderson shelter, which could be put in your garden and covered over with earth. This is a Ministry of Information film showing, so they said, how comfortable the Anderson shelter could be. In actual fact, it was cold and draughty, but in many cases it was safe and saved many lives. For people who didn't have gardens, uh, a Morrison shelter was provided, named after the Home Secretary Herbert Morrison, seen here with Mrs Churchill. And this was like a big cage where the whole family could crawl into it and then uh, they put a, an iron grill in front of it. And there are instances of whole houses collapsing on top of these Morrison shelters and people providing them a pocket of air surviving the, uh, the damage. There were also public shelters in the streets as well. And this is a good example. The Ministry of Works shelter in the road looks relatively unharmed, whereas this street, Blackstone Street, in the Canton area of the city, was completely destroyed in the Blitz on Cardiff in January 1941. At the house on the corner, seven people were taking shelter after a funeral earlier that day. All seven of them were killed when a landmine fell on the buildings. War was declared on September the 3rd, 1939, and children began to be evacuated out of the big cities to places of relative safety. For the moment, Cardiff was a neutral area, neither sending nor taking evacuees, but the children did pass through Cardiff Station to the rural suburbs of Flanishan, Rubina, St Fagans, the areas around Cardiff, and also to the areas north of Cardiff in the valleys beyond, where they would be safe from German bombs. In that first winter of the war, very little happened, in fact. It's sometimes described as the phony war. In that winter, more people were killed in the blackout than on the Western Front, in this picture, taken in the Ely area of Cardiff, you can see the signs of the blackout. The white marks on the lampposts and the trees, and the white lines on the pavement as well. No lights at all were to be shown, because uh, it was believed that a, a light could be seen from the air. Cars had, uh, were dimmed, so that they only had tiny headlights, and anyone showing a light uh, was liable to be prosecuted. People had to put up blackout curtains to make sure that the, any lights that they had within the house could not be seen from the road. The only other sign that war had come to Cardiff were these barrage balloons, which were intended to prevent low-flying aircraft from flying over the city. This is one of the barrage balloon sites in Cate's Park. Uh, these barrage balloons were manned by 16, by 16 women or by 10 men, and sometimes they could cause problems. On one occasion, one of them broke free from its moorings and knocked down chimney pots all along Cowbridge Road. And in the end, they had to send a Spitfire up to try and shoot it down. It was the only way to stop it causing more damage. The phony war came to an end on the 10th of May 1940, when Hitler launched his, uh, his forces against France, uh, Belgium and Holland in the West. This is a cartoon by J.C. Walker, who was a famous cartoonist of the South Wales Echo at that time, a brilliant cartoonist, but this really, on this occasion, his prophecy didn't come true. He suggests here that Hitler is falling onto the bayonets of the Allied nations.
but in fact within five weeks the German army had overrun Western Europe and France was forced to surrender. The British army managed to escape from Dunkirk, leaving most of their equipment behind. At this time the paddle steamers, which had uh, in peacetime sailed around the Bristol Channel carrying trippers to Weston and Ilfracombe, were now used to help evacuate the troops from Dunkirk. This is the Glen Avon, with tired British soldiers on board, making their way back to the safety of the United Kingdom. The soldiers who came back from Dunkirk were for a time billeted at this camp on the heath in Cardiff. You can see the camp in this aerial photograph. Later in the war, the camp was used for the Americans, and there was also a small prisoner of war camp there as well. Now Britain was threatened with invasion, the biggest threat of invasion for nearly a thousand years, and all sorts of preparations were made. If you look carefully on, the bri on this bridge here at College Road, you can see plates across the road, which were intended as tank traps. They look quite innocent, but if a tank passed over those, then the plates would, uh, would uh, be removed and long poles would emerge, seven feet long perhaps, which could destroy the bottom of a tank. At least that was what they hoped. <laughs> With the threat of invasion, Britain became a united country, more so than perhaps than at any time in its history. And all sorts of uh, devices were made to try and involve the civilian population in the national war effort. Here, women were persuaded to give up their pots and pans for the war effort. Lord Beaverbrook persuaded them that these pots and pans could be made into aluminium, which could be used to make Spitfires or other aircraft. In actual fact, you do not make aircraft out of scrap metal, but at the same time it was a great boost to morale as people felt they were doing something to help win the war. It was now that women did many of the men's jobs uh, that had been done in peacetime. The men were needed at the fighting front, and so women went into all kinds of, of occupations. One of the favourites was the Women's Land Army. Here we see women working on, uh, in the Vale of Glamorgan, bringing in the harvest. They drove tractors, they hauled logs, they did backbreaking work which was normally done by men, and ensured in the process that Britain never starved. Women also went into the factories, such as this Royal Ordnance Factory at Llanishan, making guns, munitions and other equipment. Britain was the first country in the Second World War to conscript women and make a service compulsory. Every lady between 18 and 41 was forced to do some kind of war work or help the national war effort. The, there was a tragedy at the Royal Ordnance Factory in the Second World War. It always worked on during air raids, but it was never actually bombed, although the Germans did make it a target. But in March 1944, uh, after an alert, anti -aircraft, an anti-aircraft shell fell on the, uh, on the factory and nine people were killed, one of the tragedies of so-called friendly fire. Apart from their normal jobs, people were now expected to indulge in voluntary services as well. And this is uh, the fire service at Insole Court in Llandaff being inspected by Herbert Morrison in 1940. Apart from the regular fire service, there were auxiliaries, volunteers, who became so good at their job that uh, they were eventually amalgamated into the National Fire Service. Other people went into civil defence work. Some of them were rescue workers, others were air raid wardens. Very vital jobs when the Blitz began on Cardiff. Here they are being inspected by the King and Queen and a young-looking Princess Elizabeth in 1944 outside the City Hall. Perhaps the most famous of the volunteer organisations was the Home Guard, people who were the local defence volunteer, where men joined up uh, to help fight off an invasion if it ever took place. Here are new recruits being inspected on the Cardiff Arms Park in the summer of 1940. Lots of stories are told about the Home Guard, Dad's Army, uh, but it must be remembered that they did very important work guarding military installations and helping in the training of the regular soldiers. But there are funny stories about them as well. And as a child, I lived at St Fagans, and I was playing in the Plymouth Woods, when one day a platoon of Home Guard came along and uh, shooed us away. We stayed around to see what they were doing, and it seemed to us they were playing the same sort of games that we were, cowboys and Indians, but they wouldn't let us join in, and we were very disappointed at the time. After the fall of France, Cardiff was no more than half an hour's flying time uh, away from the Luftwaffe and the first raids took place on the docks in the summer of 1940. This is the San Felipe in Cardiff docks, which was bombed in July. 
Seven people were killed in his air raid, and there would have been more but for the heroism of a doctor by the name of Tim O'Brien, who heard screaming men in the hold, saw that the rungs of the escape ladder had been shot away, and then had himself lowered in with a tub and dragged up as many of the survivors as he could. For this he was awarded a medal, one of the many instances of bravery during the Blitz. What were called hit-and-run raids took place in the autumn of 1940 at the time of the Battle of Britain. Just a few aircraft launching raids at night, like this one on the Roth area in September at Anger Street, where two people were killed in this particular instance. At this time, the raids didn't do a great deal of damage, and it did give time for the various uh, air, air raid services and the fire brigade to finalise their training, really, without being under too much pressure, ready for when the big raid came. And come it did, on January the 2nd, 1941. A bright, moonlit night, with snow still on the ground, the raid began at 20 to 7 in the evening. And it began with flares being dropped, lighting up the scene with a sort of greenish hue, and then heavy explosive bombs, followed by incendiaries being dropped. The worst damaged area in the city was the Riverside area, where 60 people were killed in the first hour of the raid. This shows De Burg Place in Grangetown, looking towards Rawdon Place with Neville Street bisecting it in the middle. And you can see the amount of damage done here. After, uh, after the war, the area was rebuilt. And here again you have an example of where the worst air raids took place in Cardiff. Notice how Rawdon Place in the background, where only slight damage was done, was virtually rebuilt as it was. But the rest of the premises which were destroyed in that raid of January the 2nd were rebuilt in brick. And quite often you will find a block of houses in the traditional red sandstone of, uh, of the 19th century. And then you will see a block where it's, there are just brick houses rebuilt after the Second World War. And you can be sure that a bomb fell where those brick houses are built. The worst single incident of that night on January the 2nd took place here in Grangetown at the corner of Stockland Street and Corporation Road, where today Clarence Hardware stands. But in 1941, it was Hollyman's Bakery, and it was also an air raid shelter in the cellar. And when the alert sounded, people trooped down into the cellar to take shelter. It received a direct hit, and all 32 people were killed, including Hollyman the baker. As many of the bodies as possible were removed afterwards to be buried, but some of them could, uh, were so disintegrated they could not be found. And in a sense, this is still a war grave today. And a plaque tells us about this raid of January the 2nd, 1941. Uh, at 8 o'clock in the evening, a landmine fell on the of Cathedral. At the time, a home guard saw what happened from the of Institute nearby. He saw the parachute coming down and he saw the bomb strike the cathedral. Miraculously, no one was killed when this bomb fell and had it drifted a few yards further on its parachute, uh, dozens of people might well have been killed. Apart from Coventry, Llandaff was the worst bombed cathedral of any British city in the Second World War. Services could not resume until 1942 and only the chancel could be used then for, uh, for services and the cathedral was not rebuilt until after the war. Cartoonists tried to keep up people's spirits by making jokes about the Blitz, like this one you can see here, where we have an American visitor talking to a home guard and the home guard is telling him the last international match played here was between Wales and England and the American says to him gee it must have been a hell of a game because as you can see the damage in the background where a landmine had fallen on the north stand uh, causing more or less destroying it uh, in, in that raid. 165 people were killed that night in the worst raid upon Cardiff and a mass burial was held for many of them in Cate's Cemetery the following Wednesday, attended by the Lord Mayor and by the Bishop of Landaff. And the South Wales Echo, reporting the funeral, said that it was a scene that those who were present would never forget. The raid of January the 2nd was the worst raid on Cardiff, but other raids were to follow. There were many raids, but four were what were called major air raids. The next time the Cardiff was bombed was on March the 3rd, 1941, and this time it was the Roth area of Cardiff that suffered most. This is Roth Road Church, a Wesleyan church which had stood there for many years before the Second World War. But that night fire bombs fell on the, on the church and completely destroyed it. It was a landmark like this for some years afterwards, but eventually it was, uh, the premises were sold and now Heron House stands on this site. 
One of the most tragic incidents of that raid occurred here at the junction of Albany Road and Newport Road. Frank Gacken was the commander of the Auxiliary Fire Service and that night he was down at the uh, fire headquarters in Westcott Street where news came through that there were severe fires in the Roth area of the city and more equipment was needed. Every single appliance was out at the time so Frank Gacken loaded up his car, it was a big American car that he had, and set off for Roth. And by pure chance as he was passing this spot a bomb fell directly on his car. He of course was killed and his car completely destroyed. This is Howard Gardens High School as it was at that time and looking at the, in the Roth area of Cardiff and looking at it you would think that uh, it would not be possible for work to resume at the school afterwards. But within 10 days lessons had begun again at this school. Some of the children were, to, uh, were moved to Cardiff High School nearby and continued their lessons there. Most of the equipment had been destroyed but people carried on. Children carried on like, uh, uh, like adults during wartime. It was expected of you and that's what you did. And several Cardiff schools were bombed in the war but very little time was lost in children's education as both teachers and pupils carried on afterwards. The third big raid took place on the night of April the 29th, 30th, 1941. This time there was no air raid warning as there usually was. Instead there were four great explosions from landmines, uh, which was the first warning that the Blitz had begun. The target probably was the civic centre of Cardiff, but wartime bombing was very inaccurate. One bomb fell on this air on, in Cates at Wyvern Road. And in this house, that, or the, what remains of this house that you can see here, lived the Palmer family. There were 12 of them, and all 12 were killed in, by that bomb. There was another son who was serving with the army in, in Africa, and he heard news that all his family had been killed, where he was the one who expected to be in danger. One of the sad stories showing how civilians faced as many dangers as soldiers in the Second World War. Another landmine fell harmlessly in Cardiff Castle, but two more fell on the riverside area of Cardiff. And this uh, picture shows the kind of damage that a, a, a landmine could wreak. These were really terror weapons. They were mines which floated down on parachutes. And because the wind could carry them anywhere, they could, uh, they could cause damage wherever they landed. And if they landed in the wrong place, as they did here, then dozens of people could be killed. Like all cities, Cardiff received its share of visitors after the Blitz, VIPs. The King and Queen came to Cardiff in March, and here they are seen in the Canton area of the city, sympathising with those who had lost their homes or possibly even lost loved ones. You can see the, the, the Queen, or the Queen Mother as we later knew her, talking to rescue workers and the, Lord, the King next to the Lord Mayor. And they were given a great reception, little flags in the ruins and people... Uh, telling them about their problems, but also welcoming this visit from the royal family. A month later, there was another visitor, Winston Churchill, who visited every Blitz city. He was, wanted to see for himself how the people were coping, how their morale was standing up to the bombing, and he always promised, which may sound terrible today, but it's what people wanted to hear at the time, that the Germans would be repaid ten times over for the damage that they had done. Here he's talking to uh, ARP workers outside the City Hall and later that day he visited the Royal Infirmary uh, to see those who had been wounded during the Blitz. This was the last raid for the moment upon Cardiff and for the next two years there were only uh, occasional raids. By 1943 the danger of air raids seemed to be over but there was one last major attack and it came on the night of May the 18th 1943. It was a brilliantly planned raid by the Germans. No more than 50 aircraft were involved and the raid lasted only 83 minutes. The bombers flew north of Cardiff and then followed the railway line down through Whitchurch and down to the, to the docks at Cardiff. One target that night was the ROF factory at Lanishan, but again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, bomb, wartime bombing was very inaccurate and instead the bomb fell on St Agnes Road in the Heath area of Cardiff. And you can see the damage that was wrought. Nine people were killed where this bomb fell. But again, there were miraculous cases of people surviving. One family managed to survive by, uh, by taking shelter in their Morrison shelter. There were pockets of air which allowed them to breathe. And later, they were rescued. The raiders continued their run down towards the city centre. This was the, these were the premises of Brown Brothers, tyre manufacturers. And as you can see, the building was completely gutted as the bombers passed over.
They then proceeded to attack installations in the docks. This is the Butte Road station, which was put out of action for a week afterwards. Also, the telephone lines were also put out of action as well. And two platforms at Cardiff General Station were also uh, incapacitated after this raid. Probably the Germans wreaked as much havoc in this raid as in some of the bigger raids earlier. Still following the railway line, the bombers made their escape westwards. And some of the last bombs to fall on Cardiff fell here in Lansdowne Road in the Canton area of Cardiff. This was to be the last major raid upon Cardiff. But the following year, when the Normandy landings took place, soldiers soon discovered V1 and V2 sites pointing at South Wales. If they had not been captured in time, then they would have caused even more carnage. It's surprising that Cardiff was not bombed rather more than it was, because in the Second World War it was a very important port. Three quarters of the supplies for the American forces passed through the ports of South Wales, and two thirds of the imports from the United States and Canada also came to the South Wales ports. The picture here shows a ship being unloaded in January 1941, before America had entered the war, uh, when the Americans were sending as much help as they could to Britain without actually entering the war themselves. But two years later, America was in the war, and American soldiers were being landed direct at Cardiff docks. For a time, the sounds of Chicago and New York were familiar on the streets of Cardiff, and the Americans generally were very welcome visitors. They were especially welcomed by the children. Uh, they were kind to children. They organised parties for them. And I attended one of those parties at the Ridlava Hospital uh, towards the end of the war, where I was given all kinds of presents and uh, a marvellous food that I'd, that I'd not seen for many years. They also gave us chocolate and Hershey bars and chewing gum, and generally with the children, they were very popular. They were popular often with the adults as well. Sometimes there were problems, but generally they were welcome visitors, and people were glad to see them, knowing that they were helping us in the war. And here at Whitchurch, on Whitchurch Common, uh, a United States hospital unit was based. And towards the end of the war, when they were moved, they decided to show their appreciation of the way the people of Whitchurch had received them, so they planted this avenue of trees alongside the road. Some of the trees have become destroyed in recent years, but the plaque is still there, reminding us of the time when Britain and the United States were close allies and the Americans were welcome visitors to this country. Most of the signs, most of the, signs of the American presence have now gone, including the hospital that they built at Red Lava. Following the invasion of Europe in 1944, it was expected that there would be heavy casualties. And here, American servicemen who had been wounded in battle were brought to, for, for their wounds to be treated. The hospital has now gone, but for a long time after the war, it continued to be used by the National Health Service. By May 1944, the docks at Cardiff were a beehive of activity, as preparations were being made for the invasion of Hitler's European fortress. Here we can see tanks being unloaded at the docks. The dockers alone could not cope with the volume of traffic, and American soldiers and British soldiers also helped in the unloading. These are locomotives from uh, the United States, which were intended to be used after D-Day to replace the rolling stock on the continent, which would have been destroyed in the bombing. For a time, they were stored in the valleys of South Wales, and after the invasion, they were taken to Normandy and then were used to carry, to tra carry transport uh, and replace those uh, trains which had been destroyed. As the invasion day drew near, so the landing craft began to emerge into the, into the docks. All the Cardiff docks were used, so were the docks at Penarth, Barry, and all along the South Wales coast. Generally for the Americans, this was to be one of the major ports for the invasion. Here is a hospital ship a reminder of the fact that the invasion was not expected uh, to be very easy and that heavy casualties would be sustained. As it turned out, the casualties were less than expected, but thousands of men still lost their lives in the liberation of Europe. This is one of the most interesting pictures of, of the Second World War, so far as the, the docks is concerned. It's known as the Prairie, near the Queen Alexandra dock, and I found it in the dock manager's office and on the back it was stamped top secret and the date was there, June the 4th, 1944, two days before D-Day. You can see tanks and lorries waiting to be loaded, tents for the troops who were waiting to disembark for the invasion of, of, of Normandy.
Every ship sailed to the minute, as the docks register proudly proclaims, and the American accent disappeared from Cardiff as they began the liberation of Europe. The war still had nearly a year to run, and but rationing was tighter than ever. During the war, people were given uh, essential foods were rationed, and this gives an example of a week's rations for people. I think it was eight ounces of tea at the time, uh, very little meat. Meat was rationed by price, not very much sugar, as you can see, and not very much butter or cheese. People were also given points, which which they could buy little luxuries, such as jam, or sometimes dried egg, which was a substitute for the real thing. And Britain never starved in the Second World War. Bread was never rationed, and there were always plenty of fruit and vegetables. And it's said that people ate more healthily during the war than they did afterwards. Britain, uh, the people of Britain were encouraged to grow their own food as much as possible. Every garden, people grew vegetables. Even the tops of air raid shelters, bomb sites, parks were turned into allotments because every scrap of food that could be grown by the people meant that there was more shipping space for other materials. And areas like Butte Park that we can see here were turned into uh, fields for wheat and hay and here's haymaking taking place in 1943. Generally the harvest was gathered in by older pupils, sixth formers or fifth formers at the grammar schools or ch older children in school who helped to gather this in. They were paid a little bit, it was part of their holidays and they felt they were doing vital work. People in many cases were better paid than they'd ever been before during wartime but there was very little to spend their money on. Consumer goods like toys or uh, equipment for the home were, were rarely available and in any case it was spelt somewhat unpatriotic to spend your money on what were then regarded as luxuries. Instead, people were expected to save. And so you had this horrible thing, the squander bug as he was known, with his na this Nazi swastika daubed upon him to remind people that they should put their money into war savings. The first efforts at war savings began in the summer of 1940. This is the Coach and Horses Inn at Castleton, where supporting the Lord Mayor of Cardiff's Spitfire Fund. In the course of a week, £30,000 were raised, and it's an interesting thought today that that was enough to buy five Spitfires, those wonderful aircraft which won the Battle of Britain. Later, things became more organised, and here we see a Spitfire in April 1941 being shown outside the City Hall in Wings for Victory Week. On the other side, out of, view, out of our view, outside the National Museum, is a Hank Hill bomber that, he, that it had shot down. Wings for Victory, Salute the Soldier and Warships Weeks were very popular in the Second World War. People were expected to contribute generously and £3 million was usually raised on each occasion and usually more than that. All sorts of exhibitions were held, parades, football matches, dances, all kinds of events designed to bring in the money. It would be wrong to think that the war years were times of continual misery. There was a great deal of sadness but people managed to get by and often enjoyed themselves. And in those days, the favourite activity to enjoy yourself was going to the cinema or going to the pictures, as it was known. This is a patriotic programme at the Empire and the Olympia in October 1942. Mrs Miniver was probably the most popular film of the Second World War. And the queues outside the cinema were so great, stretching back beyond Cardiff Castle, that the manager of the cinema uh, put a notice in the South Wales Echo pleading with people to leave after they'd seen the film once because there were still so many people waiting to come in. League football was suspended during the Second World War as, were, as was cricket and rugby as well but sport did continue before big crowds on occasions and uh, this photograph actually relates to just after the war in October 1945 when the famous Moscow Dynamo team toured Britain and played a game against Cardiff City at Ninian Park. It was not a good day for the City, they lost the match 10-1, but it's worth remembering that many of these players were at that time only part-time. They're expected to do war work as well, and many of them have been on the night shift um, in the factories or in the mines the night before. So, uh, But the match was enjoyed by a huge crowd of more than 50,000. By, by the spring of 1945, it was felt that it was safe to release prisoners of war uh, to carry out tasks around the city. These prisoners are clearing snow in Working Street, near this, this, the old library, after one of the worst snowfalls for many years. Uh, 
They're not closely guarded. There's a policeman keeping an eye on them, but I don't think he's armed. And most of them are now, most of the prisoners are now ang as anxious for the war to end as the British people. German prisoners of war still had a sting in the tail. In March 1945, 67 of them escaped from the prisoner of war camp at Island Farm near Bridge End. And for a week, many, most of them were at free. They were eventually all recaptured. But uh, this cartoon in the news of the world shows uh, some, of the, uh, some of the events that went on while they were, people were hunting for them. The cow is being milked by a German prisoner and the countryman there is telling the policeman, I do believe it's one of those German prisoners. You can tell by the disgusted face on poor Clarabelle's face. Eventually all the prisoners were recaptured and there would have been nowhere for them to go by this time if they'd escaped to Germany because by this time most of the country was occupied. May the 8th, 1945 was VE Day, the day that the, the, the war in Europe came to an end. Crowds began to gather in the city centre from early in the morning. Someone had managed to gather some detonators that day, which he placed on the uh, tram rails. And every time a tram went over them, there was a loud bang. But the police turned a blind eye to that, as they did to many things that day, as people began to gather in the, in the centre of Cardiff. In the early afternoon, crowds began to gather outside the City Hall to hear Winston Churchill proclaim on the radio, or wireless as we knew it in those days, that the war was over. He made his speech at three o'clock, by which time there were 50,000 people present. They had been entertained for a while by the choir of the Cardiff schools, but once the message had been received, the joyous celebrations began. Uh, street parties were held in almost every street in Cardiff. For weeks, people had been saving up their rations. Grocers sometimes gave their entire stock of luxuries, which they'd been carefully hoarding for a while. People contributed money. Homemade bunting was stretched across the street and the children had the party of their lives. In the evening it was the turn of the adults as a, pa as a piano was wheeled out into the street or an accordion and people danced in the street and celebrated the end of this terrible war. Of course, there were sad moments for many. Some had lost relatives, some had lost uh, sons or fathers fighting at the front. And the following Sunday in the shell of Land of Cathedral a Thanksgiving service was held uh, to give thanks for the end of the, uh, for the for our victory, but also in remembrance of those who had died. For some, the war was not yet over. Japan had entered the war in 1941, and troops from South Wales had been sent to, uh, to Burma and to the Far East to try and halt their advance. This is the Burma Star Window in St John's Church in Cardiff, remembering the men of the 14th Army who fought so gallantly in that campaign. The nearest thing to a PALS battalion in the Second World War was the Cardiff 77th Heavy Artillery Regiment, or the 77th ACAC. It contained sportsmen such as Wilfred Wooler, Les Spence, and Cardiff City footballers Bob Tobin and uh, Billy James. They were captured when the Japanese overran the island of Java and suffered terrible misery during the next three years as prisoners of the Japanese. Then, on August the 15th, after the dropping of the atomic bomb, the Japanese finally surrendered. These are crew. Once again, the celebrations took place. A uh, crowd gathered here outside the city hall. But many of, among this crowd, there are probably many anxious people waiting to know if their loved ones had survived as prisoners of the Japanese. It was not until a couple of weeks later that members of the 77th ACAC began to return to Cardiff. Of the 800 men from South Wales who made up that regiment, only 200 ever returned to the city. There are several memorials to the Second World War in and around Cardiff. This is the Merchant Seamen's Memorial in Cardiff Bay. It's a reminder that 30,000 merchant seamen lost their lives in the Second World War, ensuring that Britain never starved. And many of them came from this area of Cardiff in Butte Town. On the 50th anniversary of VE Day in 1995, it was decided to unveil a memorial in Cate's Cemetery to the victims of the Cardiff Blitz. This is the memorial, and in the background you can see wooden uh, plaques which uh, mark the graves of those who are buried there. It's a reminder that civilians as well as soldiers suffered during the Second World War, and it's also a reminder that we can be thankful for the 60 years of peace that we've had since that terrible war.